Welcome to the World Famous Adventurers Club. My name is Grant McComb, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you tonight Melissa Lesh, uh, who is a fine artist and best known for her recent documentary, Wildcat, available on Amazon Prime. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Grant. It's great to be here. And hello, everybody. Uh, that I, I wish I could be there in person, but I'm on the opposite coast. It's a little bit later here. I'm in Virginia. Well, thank you so much for joining us all, all the way from Virginia. Um, as I, you know, uh, alluded to, you're an artist, and uh, from your bio, you were born with a paintbrush in your hand. So let's start at the beginning. Let's talk about your background and uh, jump right in. Yeah. Yeah, I would say I had somewhat of an unconventional upbringing. So my, my father's a fine artist, a uh, sculptor and painter. My mom's a musician, a cellist. And I was born in Mumbai, India, which is about as opposite of a place that you can get to Wisconsin, which is the other place that I grew up. So I was straddling India and Wisconsin as a kid and was always painting, was turning over logs, looking for bugs. Um, I was kind of split between uh, school and, and public school in Wisconsin and essentially homeschool or schooling myself in India. Uh, we lived in an IIT campus um, where my mom was studying music and there was leopards that would come into the campus every night to feed on the, the stray dogs. And so they would set traps with goats in them. And I remember just being a kid and, you know, you'd cycle through this campus backed up to a national park and, you know, there'd be these cages with live goats to catch the leopards. And I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> um, and, you know, from a young age, I, I think growing up in part in India gave me that appreciation for wildlife. Uh, we had monkeys coming to our, to our windows, you know, every day asking for food and um, there's just nothing like it. So I think, I think between India and Wisconsin, I also had to kind of culturally uh, be very culturally malleable. And I had to learn how to kind of switch in between different types of places and be able to adapt very quickly, um, which I now apply to my work. But uh, but yeah, the fine art piece of it um, has always been a driving force for me. So I went to school for painting and printmaking. Um, and it was one of those things where, you know, when you're starting off and you're trying to figure out how do you communicate the things you're passionate about, um, I was painting wildlife as a kid. I was always painting. I had oil paints and um, and gouache and watercolor, and I was painting landscapes and detailed portraits of wildlife. And eventually, after going to art school, I realized that painting isn't the most effective medium for me to communicate the things that I'm interested in. And most importantly, to be in the places that I wanted to be. I think that was really key was uh, they were basically preparing you in art school to live in a in a studio basement in New York City. And that's about the opposite of where I wanted to be. Yeah, you know, from, you know, what I've read about you online and, and from your your um, uh, your documentary, it seems like you have a lot to say. And moving from art, fine art to film, uh, I mean, it seems like you were you were able to uh, convey a, convey a lot. So if you want to shift to, um, so sorry about that, guys. I really should have trimmed my beard. So sorry. Uh, yeah, walk us through your journey from fine art to film, and talk about how the fine art has influenced your approach to filmmaking. Yeah, I I picked up the camera, essentially you know, out of necessity or, or in some ways by accident. So I was working with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I was in college, I was painting, I was mostly doing conceptual, but, um, but some more realistic painting. And wildlife was always in the back of my mind. And, and, you know, I had lived in India and done a lot of volunteering with different wildlife organizations, rescue centers. Um, and so I started uh, actually interning with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and during the summers, I would work as a biological technician, so doing you know invasive species removal or brood surveys. Um, I was always split between these two worlds, and and actually, as one of the kind of final projects with the Fish and Wildlife Service, they wanted us to make a book or do a presentation, and I said, well, can I um, can I make a short film? You've got some camera equipment on refuge. It was this was right on the border of of Canada. I was at Moosehorn National Wildlife Refuge, all the way up in northern Maine. Um, and they said, yeah, you know, you, we've got a camera here, try it out. So I essentially 
picked up the camera, taught myself, you know, the essentials. I was living in this little cabin out in the middle of the woods, YouTubing, how do you edit, you know, how do you stitch pieces of footage together? And I remember some of my early um, soundtracks, I, I didn't know how to like rip music or even like where to get score. Um, so I sang into my, <laughs> I basically sang my own uh, score to accompany my film at the time. I, I really don't like to listen to it and go back, but you know, you have to start somewhere. Um, so yeah, it, it became for me, a, a, another creative medium and a way to, at that time, capture the work we were doing and to be close with wildlife. And I think what I, what I realize now that I was starting to realize then is that it also allowed me to ask questions about things that, I was curious about um, and that I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. I, th I think film is one of those beautiful things, documentary in particular, where, you know, it gives you this kind of pass to be in places and ask things and to connect with people in ways that you might not otherwise, you know, or people that you might not otherwise connect with um, in ways that surprise you and teach you something. I actually think it's a fantastic jumping off point into Wild. And I believe we do have the trailer play here. I don't think that was all my beard, folks. Five o'clock shadow. <laughs> so we're gonna go ahead and play that trailer and then jump off into some questions about Wildcat. Wow. I love you. I'm in this most beautiful place in the world, and I can't be happy. When I was in Afghanistan, I was medically discharged with PTSD. I felt that life wasn't worth living, and maybe I should just go when no one knows if I'm alive, no one knows if I'm dead. That's when my life really took a turn. This is Keanu, our ocelot rescue. He will be reintroduced into the wild in a year and a half. I didn't know if it was going to be doable. Their alternative is living a life in the zoo or dying in a much worse way. This is your new home. Don't give up. Don't give up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to teach you how to become a killer. Amazon tree boa. This is the snake. This project with Keanu, it's like his redemption. He's saving me and I'm saving him. This is one of the most dangerous environments in the world. That's a wandering spider. Keanu, I know it still hurts. It's really difficult working in an unprotected area. <sighs> you okay? You scared me. Don't follow me. Now he knows where Harry lives. But I'm worried that he can't live by himself. <laughs> He caught his first rodent. He caught his first rodent. I love you. You've long gone. I've seen the jungle change people. I feel like I've done something good. But it's hard to let go of something you love. But it's now or never. We're wild animals. Me and you, we're wild. So doing conservation work on the U.S.-Canadian border is a long way from shooting a documentary in Peru. Talk to me about how you got there and conceived of this idea to shoot uh, this documentary that really intersects conservation and mental health. I wouldn't say it was a direct jump. There was a lot of steps along the way. So um, 
you know, teaching uh, after teaching myself how to edit and and to shoot. At that point, I started um, teaming up with actually scientists here in Virginia, uh, my university. We were working on a lot of short films, um, and they were educational pieces about a lot of the research that was happening in the biology department and along the James River, America's founding river, right here that runs through Richmond, Virginia. We've got incredible, you know, nine foot fish, 300 pound fish that are uh, breaching and spawning right here in the rapids that I made a film about. We've got um, blueback herring and American shad. There's, uh, you know, amazing bald eagles and, and a lot of wildlife. There's otters right here along the river. So it was an amazing place to start documenting some of these right here in my backyard. Um, so I also, at the time, started learning how to whitewater kayak, um, started traveling all around the world. I did a lot of kayaking in Nepal and Norway and northern British Columbia, um, you know, kind of started understanding expedition style, um, uh, you know, backpacking or, or whitewater kayaking. Self, it was a lot of self-support expedition. Mm. Um, and so a lot of those trips, even though they were for whitewater, you know, I was filming and, and taking pictures along the way and building my skills. And I think that's every project that I worked on, whether it's filmmaking, starting to refine, you know, the type of stories that I'm telling and also just how to use a camera, um, how to edit, or if it's actually in the field, you know, remote camping or remote, um, remote trips, it's all kind of building to, I think everything was building to wildcat. It's kind of what it feels like. Um, and so, you know, the, about that time when I was um, kayaking, I met my partner, Trevor Frost, who also grew up, um, you know, being in the outdoors and, and loving nature. So we started kayaking together and it became pretty clear that we were both interested in the same thing. Spoiler, Trevor Frost is uh, also the co-director on Wildcat and, and my partner. Um, so we started teaming up and doing similar projects. Uh, we got a grant with National Geographic to go to Northern Australia and uh, we worked eight months to document uh, saltwater crocodiles, which are the largest and, and most powerful uh, crocodile on the planet, reptile on the planet. And it was, you know, it was all kind of prepping us, I think, for this film, which is you have to be able to um, be very uncomfortable for long periods of time. You have to um, you know, be able to connect with people and kind of drop into a place and go very, very deep. Um, we spent, so just getting to Wildcat, we spent each about 200 days in the field filming. Um, and it took us four years. So it's been, you know, the biggest project we've worked on to date. Um, and everything, everything until now was mostly short films. The last film, I, I directed and edited with 17 minutes. Um, so this was a huge, you know, jump in the deep end and, and something, to be honest, we didn't know we had a feature film. We started actually thinking we had a short film. And then as it goes documentary, you know, throws you for a loop, so. Yeah, I guess filming for 200 hours, you have a lot of footage that you can then put together into uh, something a little more robust than 17 minutes. That's fantastic. Uh, let's go a little technical. Let's talk about, uh, some of the first uh, instances of, of filmmaking. You know, you you're completely self-taught. You're going out and you're you're teaching yourself how to use these this equipment. What's some advice you have for an aspiring filmmaker who wants to go out and shoot, you know, uh, nature, um, and some of the pitfalls they can avoid? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is use what you have. You know, and now with phones and technology, it's so good. I mean, I started with a small point and shoot. My first camera was a Canon T2i, um, you know, my first digital camera. And I think for me, it's easy to get caught up in the technicals and feel like you have to know everything. You have to have it completely dialed in before you can tell a story or like start the process of figuring it out. But for me, the story and the content has always driven my interests. Um, and I'm never one that like gets super teched out with like, oh, this crazy lens. I mean, I appreciate the technology and I, you know, I understand it enough to to make a movie, but I, I'm much more interested in what 
what you're trying to say with the equipment and how, how you're going about doing that. So, yeah, I would say, you know, the best for the best thing is like film with what you have and where, and, and, and where you are, you know, cause there's so much wildlife. I mean, just go into a local park or your backyard. I, I started filming dragonflies down by the river, which by the way, are extremely difficult to film, <laughs> um, especially mating and laying eggs. They're very fast. They're some of the fastest insects on the planet. And, uh, I had my drone kind of like mimicking the flight of the dragonfly and they actually, they, they lay their eggs and they, their, their first phase of life is underwater. And so I played around with like underwater GoPro cameras, filming their underwater life cycle. And then as the dragonfly comes out of the water, they ha they hatch in these beautiful little pools called rock pools, which I won't go into, but I made a film about it and they rise out of these rock pools and then hatch and fly away. And so I had this underwater camera, the GoPro, and I rose with this hatching dragonfly. And then my drone took off as the dragonfly was kind of taking off. So, you know, get creative, like think from that point of view too. Like what is that animal experiencing and, and what's the best way to capture, you know, new behaviors or natural history that we might not have ever seen before. You don't need a lot to do it. You know, I think you just need to pay attention um, and you need to be super patient, especially with wildlife. Yeah, super unpredictable. Wildlife kind of is what it is and it is where it is. Uh, moving down to Peru, what were you shooting on? What did your crew look like over those 200 days of filming? And uh, what were some of your favorite moments as you were shooting this? Yeah, it's funny you say crew. It was just me and Trevor. <laughs> um, so yeah, it was it was essentially four of us at the beginning. So it was my, myself, Trevor, we were the directors, producers, um, and then Harry and Samantha are two main characters. And we were all living together. We were basically living on a 30 by 20 foot platform in the middle of the rainforest. Um, just to give you kind of an idea of how remote this is. So it's a couple day, you know, with many layovers, flight, into Lima, and then another few hour flight into Puerto Maldonado, which is right on the edge of the Peruvian Amazon. And then from there, it's maybe a four or five hour car journey at the, into this on this logging road into this little port at the edge of the Las Piedras River. Depending on the road, sometimes when it's really muddy, it'll take longer, but from the port, it's an hour boat ride up, up river, and then another, let's say 20 minute hike into the jungle. Um, so it's, you know, and you're carrying a lot of gear, you're carrying heavy gear, um, oftentimes through at least a foot or two of mud. So it's a trek out there, um, which gives you constant entertainment, laughs, you know, mistakes. I mean, you're just falling in mud all the time. 90% of the time when we're coming in, and like I said, it's just me and, and Trevor, uh, Sam's got like a monkey that she just rescued, or there's, you know, macaws in the back of the car. We're packed into this tiny little car driving through the mud and, and trying to get in. So there's always something, um, or, you know, she'll get a call and before you know it, we're on, on the road to rescue a new animal or something. Um, but yeah, we, so I, I've got a C300 Mark II. Uh, we filmed a lot on that. We filmed a lot on a 5D. Uh, also our phones, it was kind of a bit of everything. We really just, yeah, you can see here Keanu, um, with a Sony, we had a Sony handy cam that we gave Harry to document his time with Keanu and Keanu loved the dead cat. So he would, it's the little, I know it's, it's kind of a bad name. <laughs> it's oh, the little yeah. mic screen, uh, that goes on the shotgun mic and Keanu would just destroy that thing. So you constantly have to, you know, figure out what works and, and adapt, but yeah, you know, I mean, the, the moments were endless. I think when you're out that remote without Wi-Fi, without signal, without anything, you have to kind of entertain yourselves. Um, and little things become very entertaining. I'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So uh, what I'm hearing is I'm not catching a Spirit Airlines flight down to where you guys were. Um, you know, I, watching the documentary, I didn't get a good sense of how many animals were really coming through and being rescued. What did that look like? What, what, what did the rescue operation look like outside of these cats? 
Yeah, robust. I mean, we we filmed a lot of them. And of course, when you get down to the edit, we had over a thousand hours of footage. Um, you have to be selective and you have to pick the best and the strongest storylines, which of course was Khan and Keanu. Um, and by the way, when we started the film, Khan, we basically thought we were making a short film about Khan. And that was the archive. They had captured an amazing archive of you know Khan's upbringing, the rescue, his whole journey. And then of course his tragic death. Um, and when we first saw that footage, it was like, wow, you know, how many people that are raising these animals actually document that kind of, with that kind of intimate um, perspective. And in those really hard moments, you know, they don't stop rolling the camera, which immediately stood out to us and, and was something that we, you know, we wanted to ask and, and kind of go deeper on. Um, and then it was about a month later, actually, that we, after we started the edit, that Sam called us and said, we just got a call for, our, you know, our second ocelot, mm. Keanu. And that was when we knew we had a longer story on our hands and we could follow this journey, you know, in real time. And, um, and hopefully this was a second chance. This was a redemption. Here's my own little wildcat. <laughs> oh, what's your wildcat's name? His name's Bug. <laughs> He is a cat, not a bug. Um, well, thank Bug for making a, an appearance for us today. I'm sure there'll be more. There's three of them in this house, so there will be two more probably. Um, but yeah, so you know, there's 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 animals coming through all the time. One of my favorite rescues. His name was Max. He was a baby howler monkey, um, and his mom actually got shot by poachers, um, and the bullet went through her shoulder. And it actually, it went through and like grazed Max's shoulder. Mm. So he was this little baby at the time. So was, was he a contender for potentially being the star of the show here? Could it have been uh, Howler Monkey and, and not Wildcat? You know, he, I kept trying in the edit, I kept trying to make it work so he could make, he actually is in the movie, mm. but just briefly and he has this amazing story. I mean, you know, this baby monkey that survived and his mom was taken from him and these, these animals come in and they're just like, they need love, you know, they need connection. It's amazing. Cause we think like when you, anim when you rescue an animal, you know, it's like they, we think about the food and the, the shelter and they need stimulation and all these things. But like what we don't think about is the love and they need, they need connection. And if they don't have that from a mom or a sibling, um, you know, you, you have to play that role too. And so I think for Sam, actually one of the really interesting things that she's doing now with her rescue center is she's taking uh, orphans that might be able to be released together um, and raising them together mm. so that they have that bond. So basically, how can you remove the human element you know, because in some cases that you can't, and there isn't an option, they don't have a parent, you can't, you know, create that form of separation. But when you can, um, and a lot of her new rescues she's bringing on, she's got over 26 uh, wildcats right now. She oh, actually wow. just rescued her first jaguar. That's a tough one, raising a jaguar and releasing it back into uh, the jungle. That's, that's, a, that's a challenge. You need a little more distance because that cat, as it grows up, will happily just take your head off. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, uh, this seems like a very well-oiled operation that you were able to insert yourself into and film and really be kind of a fly on the wall. How did you get kind of connected with this group and get the permissions necessary to fly down and, and really uh, participate as uh, closely as you did? Yeah, so Trevor, actually, my, my co-director and partner, he was in the Peruvian Amazon at the time looking for a new story. Uh, he was primarily doing still photography, so he was hoping to pitch a new story for National Geographic magazine. Um, and he was looking for anacondas, so the largest snake in the world. And he was spending a lot of time, you know, in swamps and also at the edge in this, in this town, at the edge of the Amazon, because they weren't finding a lot of anacondas. Um, and so he was in this hotel lobby when Harry, one of our main characters, walked by and 
He's pretty striking. He's not norm, you know, the kind of person you'd normally see in the edge of the Amazon. He's covered in tattoos and um, clearly has a story to tell. He had a, a cat tattooed on, on his neck. And a mutual friend of, of Trevor and Harry's leaned over and said to Trevor, hey, you see that you know, kid over there, you'll never believe his story. Um, and that's when, you know, he learned, he met Harry later and he learned, you know, his experience in Afghanistan and how he, why he first went to the, to the Amazon. Um, and of course, Khan, you know, at that point, Khan had, had passed. And so he called me almost immediately. I was actually on, sh on a different shoot in, in, uh, in Europe on a production and he called me and he said, you know, You'll, you'll never believe this story. And I think we've got a film on our hands. And I just remember thinking, what? A veteran raising a cat? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. um, but then it became very clear, you know, we got down there and it was this story of healing um, and this deep connection with nature, which is something that we both feel very strongly about. And, you know, the healing power of nature, that was kind of the driving force in the beginning. Um, and it, it morphed, it morphed, you know, a lot since then. I mean, to answer your question about how we got the permissions and, you know, got down there, it was really, um, Samantha was, she also, you know, she knew that we were interested in, in conservation storytelling, um, our backgrounds in terms of our connection with nature. And we kind of all took a leap together. You know, as you, as you discuss kind of what that looked like, you know, I, I was thinking about the hardest moment in the film, uh, which is Keanu's death. Uh, it's Khan's death. I'm, I'm sorry. Khan's death. Khan's death. Excuse me. No spoilers. Yeah. yeah. Death. Uh, it's it's a it's a gut wrenching um, moment in the film, and you know it's a large conservation operation, and it's probably not the only time something like that's happened while you were there. What were some other hard moments either on the production side or on the conservation side that you uh, bore witness to? Yeah. One of those moments you see in the film, it's the felling of that old growth tree. It's about a, a thousand year old Chiawaco tree. Um, and I remember being there and feeling the ground when that, old growth tree fell and you're talking about a tree that's you know over six feet in diameter um that is a massive tree and it's not just one tree right it's hundreds and hundreds of micro ecosystems that are all over this tree and species that many you know we we likely don't know all of all of the species that are living on that tree um and that the support system and when it when that tree hit the ground, it you know the earth shook and it took the whole swath of forest around it with it too because it's there's vines and everything's kind of connected, um, and that was you know it hits you in the bottom of your stomach when you feel when you feel a loss like that. Um, of course, that's a man-made problem, you know, and that that loss was was not natural. One one loss that was natural that was also very hard. Um, I mentioned Max, the baby howler monkey, who had this hard upbringing, who survived all that, who came into Ojanueva's care and was growing beautifully, became you know a whole success story. He actually was on one of these kind of exploratory. Um, adventures, you know, he, he would go off and get a little bit farther away from, from his enclosure. And as he was growing, he would start exploring a little bit more and go a little higher into the tree. And, and one day he went quite high into this tree and Harry was actually trying to get him down. And he said, Max, come here, come here. Um, and it started to rain. There was this harpy eagle that came in and Max couldn't see him or probably hear him. And harpy eagles are the most stealthy, largest uh, aerial predators in the in the Amazon. They're massive, and they have talons that will just shred anything. Their bills are huge. They're gorgeous, and and you know, I mean, they're they're one of the most yeah beautiful hunters in in the forest. Of course, they come from the sky, and so this harpy eagle came down and punctured basically Max's body and 
his talons went right through his chest and Harry was screaming and Max fell, fell, the heartbeat dropped Max and, and flew off. And, uh, that was one of the hardest moments of like trying to bring him back. Um, it took hours and eventually he did pass. And it, I think what was so hard about it was like, he also felt guilty that the heartbeat lost his meal. Like this was a natural moment that he interrupted. Um, and he had to kind of realize that, you know, you get attached to these creatures that you're trying to rehabilitate, but you're also rehabilitating them into an extremely dangerous, unpredictable environment. Um, yeah, what a high level of empathy to go. I have been raising this monkey, trying to rehabilitate it to get released into the wild, but I also feel so bad that this harpy eagle missed its missed its meal. That's, uh, that's yeah. A- well, it was kind of like like his death was for nothing, you know, like at least he could have gone and what a powerful and, and, and really elegant creature to, you know, if you were, if you were to go, that's kind of the most epic way to go. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Now, out of the 200 days you were there, uh, was there any conflict with like loggers or local populations or, or, you know, anyone who didn't see kind of eye to eye with the mission of this conservation group? Yeah. I mean, luckily Sam and Owen Wave has done an incredible job connecting with the communities. Um, it's obviously very remote, but there are, uh, there are also uncontacted peoples on the Las Piedras river, which, she makes sure to stay far away from and, and, you know, and prevent other people from going up that far up river. Um, but for the most part, I mean, there's, there's a lot of synergy down there. Sam's, you know, working very closely with the Peruvian government, even more so now than they were at that time. So they're actually getting called, you know, if the, if the government goes in or, or seizes an animal, they will call Ojanueva, Samantha, um, most of the time, you know, if it's in her area, she's the first one that they, that they call. So it's, um, of course there are loggers, but, but a lot of those aren't local. They're right. coming from the mountains. They're coming from somewhere else and they're hired. And I think one thing that I always like to hit home is that, um, you know, it's easy to kind of point the finger, even, even if you do come across an illegal logger, um, <clears throat> it's easy to point the finger at the people that are on the ground doing the work but they are just the tip of the iceberg and and really you know they're hired gun right and so the when you start looking back and you start looking at this system in the in the broader terms you see that there's a lot of people that are behind the deforestation or the you know illegal pet trading um and a lot of the markets are in the west i mean you know there's big fancy tables that have, you know, mahogany, uh, or people, you know, fancy houses with mahogany floors and endangered, uh, you know, wood, high end wood species and things like that. So there is a demand. And I think I really like to shy away from pointing fingers at people doing the work on the ground. Cause they really are trying to feed their families, you know, at the end of the day. Um, and I think once you start, yeah, following that chain back, you see that, it's not as simple as it seems. Yeah, people aren't logging for fun and uh, games. Yeah. So another big component of this film is is mental health and the mental health of your protagonist and you know the suffering of of um, uh, his partner as you know he struggles to come to terms with the death of this cat that he was raising and, and trying to rehabilitate, but also his military service. What did that look like behind the scenes and, and uh, where do you think he is now? Yeah, I mean, like I said, we had, you know, a lot of fun living together on the platform when you're out in the middle of nowhere and, and there's you're surrounded by beauty and wildlife and you're swimming in the river and, you know, you're constantly kind of finding things in the middle of the, you know, we'd go for night walks. And I remember one of the first times I ever met Harry, he took me out on um, a night walk, which is basically where you go out at night in the jungle with headlamps or, you know, flashlights and and you're looking for uh, herps, you're, you know, you're looking for amphibians, reptiles, spiders, anything that might be of interest. And we were walking along this path 
and he looks up in this tree, which I could never see what he was actually looking at. And he scales this tree just without even, he's not wearing shoes. He doesn't have any proper climbing equipment. He just scales this tree and probably 40 feet up in this tree, he kind of leans out, climbs out on this branch and pulls down one of the most incredible frogs I've ever seen in my entire life. It's the monkey frog, Philomedusa. And this thing is the, you know, the size of your head uh, with these giant eyes. And he comes down and shows me this frog. It turns out the frog has this poison that it exudes. And so he had this rash all down his face from the toxic poison of this frog. Uh, but like moments like that, where you're just like constantly kind of in awe and um, yeah, in love with this place and, and this connection. That said, you know, we, we also, when you're living out in the middle of a very remote place with, with few people, you also get very, very close and you see the moments when they're struggling, you know, and that's mentally um, or physically. There was plenty of times where, you know, we had gut bugs and, and things and you, you're kind of a family at that point. Mm. Um, and so you really, you know, one of the things in the film that you don't see is, kind of how we were processing or how we were approaching some of the things that he was specifically Harry, but also Sam was, was dealing with. Um, and when you see someone, you know, that you're so close to and that you care deeply about struggling to that degree, you can't just sit by, you know, you're not going to just be an observer at that point. And it, and with the film, you know, you kind of see that shift in Samantha when when she finally calls a suicide hotline and and gets some professional help. Um, and in all honesty, like we we were all over our heads, you know. I mean, it's it's something we talk about a lot. It's like we raise kids and you go to school and you learn, you know, mathematics and history and reading, but you don't learn, you know conflict resolution or how to handle grief or how to handle, you know, a mental health crisis. Like there's real things that you are not equipped to deal with. Right. Um, and that was the first time I had ever, you know, been in such a serious situation, especially when you're out in the middle of such a remote environment. Um, and so, yeah, that was one thing that you, that you don't see in the film, but there was long conversations and there was points where we had to be pretty pointed you know, and say, listen, we're worried about you and, you, you know, you need professional help. This is, um, this is not, we are very concerned, you know, and we can't just, because it, at a certain point you actually start facilitating. And that was something we learned, um, you know, just by kind of standing by and not really confronting the problem, you are inevitably uh, facilitating it. Yeah, and you were wearing two hats at that point, friend and filmmaker. Uh, I'm sure there was a lot of footage um, that you left off the table. Uh, there was a lot that you didn't, and for those of you who haven't seen the film, it really goes into depth and it really goes into detail uh, of the struggle and this journey. Uh, but what did that process look like for you in that decision-making process to omit or include uh, certain elements of that struggle? Yeah, we try that in the edit. I was. You know, I think when you have a thousand hours, over a thousand hours of footage and so many different ways to construct the narrative, you, you try everything, um, especially because it was our first film. We, we really just wanted to, you know, make sure we were, we were hitting this narrative right. Um, and we tried that. We tried putting ourselves in the film at first. So that was something we considered was Trevor and myself being kind of secondary characters, um, and it just didn't, it never felt right. I think because we already had so much going on. We had the Khan arc, we had the Keanu arc, we had obviously Harry and Samantha, uh, Harry and Samantha's journey, their personal backstory, the archive, right? There's already kind of so much that you're following. It didn't ultimately make sense to include ourselves, um, though we tried. And the goal was, you know, at the end of the film, when you do see Sam kind of finally realizing and confronting and also reflecting on some of her own traumas, um, you know, and how she, how she maybe has been conditioned from, from what she experienced as a child to, you know, to not fully understand how to handle these situations herself. Yeah. Um, you know, we really wanted in the edit to kind of use 
her turning point as a way to reflect our turning point. Um, and so in, in that sense, it didn't seem super crucial to include ourselves. Gotcha. And, you know, in terms of the, the decision to include or, or exclude footage related specifically to that mental health struggle, you know, there has to be a line between, you know, I really want to include this, it drives the story, and it really tells uh, um, a lot about what's going on here. And, you know, maybe this crosses the line a little bit for the, the people that were filming. What did that look like? What did that discussion look like ultimately? Yeah. So in the moment, you know, you can, you can see a lot of the film is film first person perspective. So one thing that's kind of important to mention is um, we actually couldn't have access to Keanu as part of their reintroduction protocol. He was basically limited to, you know, only the people that were reintroducing him, which was essentially Harry and at times Samantha, but they really wanted to limit his contact with anybody else. So that was a huge kind of creative challenge, you know, was not being able to film one of the main characters in the movie. Um, but because of what we saw with the Khan archive and seeing how well they documented that, we knew we could work with them to film the Keanu arc. Um, and, you know, there's an intimacy and that relationship that's really beautiful that you can kind of only capture with that first person POV. Um, so that was something we embraced, you know, almost immediately. And as you can tell, that style of filmmaking translated through the rest of the film, too. And so, you know, when we were on the platform and we were living, Harry was filming, you know, we were there, you know, we were on production about 200 days each. But there were many days when we weren't there and many months, you know, when he when he was alone. Um, so that was really when, you know, we worked together and he would set up the camera the video day that we had this kind of concept of a daily video diary where he's downloading, you know, what happened that day, how Keanu's feeling, what he was hunting, you know, what Harry is kind of going through emotionally. There was a lot of processing. And when you're out in the middle of nowhere, in some ways, the camera becomes your companion too. Um, so there was this beautiful him talking to us through the camera in a way, like his Wilson, if you will. Um, and so that style really translated, you know, throughout everything. And and when we weren't there, there was oftentimes cameras that were just set up. And when we were there too, we were rolling pretty much all the time. Um, and that, you know, could be a camera trap for an animal walking by, or it could just be we're having dinner on the platform and we're going to set up, you know, a, a tripod and, and let it roll. So many of the scenes that you see, especially some of the more severe mental health scenes, were captured by accident. Um, you know, there were not things that we anticipated capturing or that we would have, um, you know, specifically sought out to capture. Um, and so the real decision-making process, whether to include them or not, came in the edit. And that was something that we worked really hard to, you know, thread a fine needle um, because on one hand, you want to show what this is like, you know, there's not a lot of stories that really in an unflinching way show the reality of mental illness or PTSD. And we wanted to, you know, we didn't want to shy away from that. We didn't want to kind of gloss over and make it this really pretty cute Disney, Disney esque cat film. You know, this is, this is real. This is raw. This is what we experience and what, what is many, many, many people um, go through. But at the same time, you know, you don't you don't want to sensationalize. You don't want to, um, you know, graphically uh, show more than what you need to and and, and exploit, uh, you know, that emotion. And so we had an amazing team of mental health advisors that we worked very closely with. Uh, we had also, you know, scientists and conservation advisors. So it was a very delicate and and scene by scene conversation about what to include, how to include it. Um, you know, and of course we worked with our partner, Amazon and, and the creative executives there to, to really thread that, that needle. And it actually brings me to my last question before we open up to general questions here. Was Amazon a partner from the beginning or was this something that came up later as you uh, developed the concept and developed the story and kind of finished out filming and moved into editing? 
Yeah, so we um, we had already been filming for a couple years at this point. We started filming in fall of 2018. Filming for a couple years at this point. We started filming in fall of 2018. Um, and Amazon came on in 2020, fall of 2020. Um, so we had already been working on the film. We, we had all the footage, but we, um, you know, at that point we were kind of really ready to ramp up on the edit and it was a pre-sale. So the, the film wasn't done, but we had a lot of footage to sift through and they came out at a perfect time to kind of get the full team assembled um, and really kick into gear for, you know, what ended up being our, our Telluride premiere. Awesome. Well, that's fantastic. I'd love to open it up to general questions. I know we have an audience full of uh, filmmakers and adventurers. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and a mic will find you. Can you describe the platform? <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's basically an open air, three foot off the ground wood structure. Um, it's made from a very dense hardwood that uh, was actually from trees that had naturally fallen down on the Ojanueva land. So they chop up this wood essentially with chainsaws. It's all rough cut. Um, and there was a couple walls, but not fully enclosed. So we were living on basically sleeping on bunk beds um, or a tent. We had a tent. Sometimes it got really stuffy. And so we would just go out in the woods and, and have a tent that we'd put up. There's a small little kitchen. And then they had a bathroom and they were supposed to have plumbing, but for the entire time that we were working on the movie, it never worked. <laughs> so every time we wanted to bathe, we'd walk off, you know, three, three steps down the platform and then another like 20 steps down the slope of a hill to this little stream bed. And that's where we'd bathe. And um, you see a shot of them in the film, you know, it's basically like up to your ankles and you're using a little bucket to, to wash yourself. That's also where you do the dishes. Um, that's also where you can go hunting for baby anacondas at night and catch them. And um, Harry would always go down to the stream and like catch snakes and stuff. But yeah, it was a, it was a very breezy um, breeze would come through the open platform. Sorry, this is my little wild cat here. They always like to show their butts on the camera. I'm not sure why, but. So I have a question with with all these cameras and things. How did you keep the batteries charged up? You're using solar things, or yeah, that's a good question. We we did really. We had to kind of be, uh, you know, we had to shoot pretty minimally. So you know, we were rolling a lot, but we were shooting in 1080. You know, we couldn't we couldn't do 4K. There were just certain things that we knew wouldn't be practical. Um, so we had to up-res a lot of things in in post. But yeah, we had uh, Goal Zero battery banks. Um, we plugged those in. There was a small little solar panel on the top of the roof of the platform that we could use, you know, for just charging. There was one little light bulb, and sometimes we'd use it to charge phones or a couple batteries. But they had to last for days, so we would also just bring down a bunch of charged batteries and try and stretch them out for long periods of time. Um, because it's unpredictable, you know, and it can rain, it, storms can roll through and you might not have solar for three days, four days. Um, and you just have to be able to, you know, stretch it really, really far. Um, so I have a two part question. Um, one part being, as you mentioned, capturing thousands of hours of footage, I was curious if there was more coverage of the local indigenous groups in the communities that ended up being left out of the film ultimately. And then the second part of my question is, is if there was any pressure from the studios you were working with to create a more centralized narrative? Yeah, great question. We did, yeah, we filmed. So um, there was an amazing team on the ground at Ojanueva, um, many of whom were local. Um, 
not indigenous because there's a lot of people actually that come from Lima or come from the mountains to the the Amazon. Um, like I said, in that area, the 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 really indigenous um, groups are the uncontacted tribes, which of course we we you know were not permitted nor were we uh, able or interested to go and film. So the team on the ground at Oja Nueva was uh, largely Peruvian, it is largely Peruvian, and um, we did film quite a lot with them. They, you know, as you kind of get into the edit, you realize, again, to distill the storyline, you you really need to kind of hone in because everyone has their own story and there was, you know, something to tell for each one of them. So, you know, when you're so remote and as when once they moved Keanu up river too, and he was living in this platform, you know, those storylines kind of drop back in that we were really just out in the middle of, of the rainforest. Um, I think it's also important to think about, you know, who's telling what story um, and, and why. Um, and, you know, for us, this was, this was a story about healing and mental health and the power of nature. And so, you know, those, those other stories, we didn't feel as equipped to tell. And I think, um, I think it's an important question to ask, you know, what, yeah, what what stories are you telling it and why? So we really honed in, of course, on the on the wildlife reintroduction, the relationship of Harry and Samantha. Um, and as far as the streamlining, we we had a beautiful creative relationship uh, with Amazon. And I will say that the kind of creative freedom that we were given to really realize the story that we wanted to tell was amazing. Um, and it it felt like, like I said, like we didn't have to kind of lean out of, of any of those darker, deeper moments or those themes. We were really able to, to lean into that and to be true to, to what we experienced. Um, so yeah, it was, we didn't have to polish over anything. Um, but at the same time, of course, we also wanted to have moments of levity and, and the beauty and really capture this, this hopeful, um, this ending, so. So I mean, this is a serious question to ask, ask about the reintroduction plan for uh, wildlife back to their natural environment. And I'm thinking about Harry. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly he's therapeutic on the jungle doing rescue. Does he plan to do this forever or does he plan to return to point of origin? And is there a plan for that? Yeah, that was actually something we, we joked about towards the end of the movie was, um, you know, we have Project Rewild, which is what Sam on the back of all the shirts for her mission. And then we were joking about Project Unwild, uh, you know, Harry returning to civilization. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, we didn't know how he was gonna gonna cope. And, and clearly you see at the end of the movie, he goes back to the jungle and he spends uh, his time in Ecuador volunteering. So, yeah, I think, you know, I think he's realized that he probably will never fit very well in society and that he's most comfortable in wild places with with wild animals. Um, since filming, uh, making the movie, he has started his own nonprofit working in Ecuador um, and hoping to help other veterans, you know, uh, find kind of the same healing and, and peace that he did. Of course, he was he has a long way to go. And that's something that he has to be ready for on his own time um, and that we couldn't, you know, you, you can't force someone to, to get professional help that has to be on their own time. So my hope is that he, he finds that, you know, and he's able to, of course, continue the conservation work, which he's so well suited to do and, and is continuing to do in Ecuador. But I think, you know, hopefully he also reaches a point where he's able to, um, receive professional help for his, for, you know, the things he struggles with. Cause while nature can be an amazing healing force, uh, you know, it's not everything. We have one final question from Greg Downing, who is joining us live online, uh, tuning in on our YouTube channel. And he asks, when did you know that the film was complete? What did they say? You never, you never, you never fully complete something. You just abandon it. <laughs> uh, that's kind of what happened. We had a deadline and we had to, 
I actually, I say that, but um, there's this kind of funny thing that happens when you've been editing something for so long where one of your first rough cuts you lay out, you know, I remember kind of the structure of it and it, and it felt very intuitive and there was something where it just kind of flowed out. And then of course you go through the process of, you know, a year more editing and you're reworking everything and you're changing everything and you're trying to figure it out and you're putting a million different puzzle pieces together. And then at the end, you almost feel like you came back to the beginning. <laughs> if that makes sense, you get, you reach this point where, um, you kind of realize that your instincts were right. And, and many of the things that you had kind of put in place in the beginning were actually, and what, and those early visions, like I remember, while we were in production, I remember just having this vision of, you know, the film's going to open with them on the jungle floor, you know, and that relationship and that connection. Um, and we started the film a million different ways. And then right at the end, it was like, wait a second, what about that squirrel hunting moment when they're eye to eye, you know, right on the floor of the rainforest and he just pokes him and, you know, like launches. And it was exactly what I envisioned two years before, but we never tried it, you know, until, until the very end. Um, so I think it's those things. It's like coming back to that kind of that core that, you know, is there, it just takes a lot of time to find it. That's fantastic. Melissa, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Melissa Lesh, please. Thank you so much for having me. We hope to see you again at the club soon. We'll run an, an outro in just a moment here.